Oh, well, welcome everyone. Um, whether you are joining us live or viewing this later as a recording, we are so happy to have you here for this special webinar. My name is Naomi Hoffer. I'm the program manager for the Sherry Sobrato Burson Brain Cancer Survivorship Program. And other members of our survivorship team include Alexa Greenstein, who's our nurse practitioner, and Mary Destry, who is our Marin Expansion Program Manager. This webinar is part of our monthly Living Well After Brain Cancer Treatment series, which is one of the many offerings within our growing brain cancer survivorship program, whose mission is to enhance the wellness and quality of life of patients with brain tumors through a collaborative, multidimensional approach focusing on emotional, physical, and cognitive health. And none of this would have been possible without the passion and generous support of our featured guest here today. Sherry Sobrato Brisson is a passionate social entrepreneur and a philanthropist with a mission to support children and teens during periods of emotional distress. Following a battle of brain cancer in her 20s, Sherry dedicated her career and resources to improving children's health, which led to the launch of an innovative social venture and programs. She co-authored the award-winning book, Digging Deep, a journal for young people facing health cha challenges, which also then led to the first ever mobile game, Shadow's Edge, which we will hopefully hear more about. Sherry invests in early stage medical innovation companies and supports many organizations primarily focused on children's health and sustainability. And she helped the launch of this brain tumor survivorship program here at UCSF. Sherry is going to be in dialogue with another very significant member of our survivorship team, Dr. Suzanne Chang. Dr. Chang is an internationally recognized leader in the field of neurological malignancies. She specializes in the treatment of adults with brain tumors. Her research expertise is in clinical trial design and the development of novel therapies and imaging biomarkers for brain tumors. Yet among her many accolades and awards for medical advancement of brain tumors, what I know her to be most passionate about is patient care and quality of life. As such, she is the founding director of both the Gordon Murray Neuro-Oncology Caregiver Program and the Sherry Sobrato Brisson Brain Cancer Survivorship Program. Without both of these women and their passion for helping those living with brain cancer, we would probably not be here today offering these monthly webinars, nor the many other survivorship programs and services. So I am truly grateful to both of them and honored to have them here with us today for a conversation. Dr. Suzanne Chang and Sherry Serrato, thank you both so much for being with us today, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Naomi, and welcome to everyone, and especially welcome to Sherry. We're so pleased to have you with us. Happy, um, happy uh, St. Patrick's Day, everybody. So um, just to begin with, Sherry, we just want to again express our, our gratitude for your vision and your help with, you know, really paying attention to what happens to our patients as they go through this journey and how we can help them. But maybe we can start by you telling us a little bit about your own story and, you know, what led up to your diagnosis and what you went through. Okay, sure. That's uh, an easy one for me. Um, I certainly lived it as are many of you that are on the call today. So, I was diagnosed when I was 24. I got, I was independent at that point, had finished college and um, had moved away from my parents' home and I was actually living on the other side of the country. Um, and then I was zapped back into my parents' home uh, and treated fortunately at UCSF, which uh, saved my life. And, but before that, I had had a lot of other illnesses as a kid. I had had five eye surgeries for strabismus when, um, I was very young before the age of 10. And so I was used to being in hospitals, hanging out with child life specialists was kind of, well, which weren't even called child life specialists back then, rec therapists and other volunteers at the hospital that tried to make the whole experience of being in the hospital and being away from family. Um, well, it's hard to say a pleasant experience or at least somewhat tolerable. But um, so from a very young age, I was introduced to this idea of it's more than just treating the illness or whatever it is that you're in the hospital for. It's really about surrounding um, a patient with the love and the care and the hope that comes with um, working through, I guess you'd say, 
you know, the difficulties that come along with, with illness. So, so specifically before I was diagnosed, what was I doing? Um, I was kind of on the wrong track, let's just put it that way. I had um, wanted to study psychology when I was in college, but I didn't really give myself permission to do that. Um, not sure why, but maybe I thought it was just um, too easy. So instead I tortured myself a little bit, um, studied biology and in fact, neuroscience, um, which actually came in pretty darn handy. I never knew that it would uh, on a personal basis. I didn't end up doing that as a career, but it was something that I was fascinated by. And I just wanted uh, to learn more. So that's what I did. Um, I actually had um, experienced brain tumor symptoms for a lot of my life, um, they kept changing over time, which is probably why it wasn't identified uh, sooner than it was. You know, I got a reminder, this was 35, almost 35 years ago. So they didn't have the diagnostics that they have today. So um, I had a lot of headaches <laughs> for a lot of my life. And I was, um, you know, we looked at a lot of things, histamine sensitivity, food allergies. Um, even when I was a kid, you know, younger, they thought maybe I had some kind of a school phobia. Um, I think it's not uncommon that there's a path towards, you know, I started my journey before I ever was diagnosed. I mean, there was a path, there was some frustration there of, um, of not being able to find out what was wrong with me. But fortunately, my, my symptoms changed to the point where they were pretty aggressive. And I was actually diagnosed by a lay person and that lay person um, are not diagnosed, but anyway, I was tipped off to what I have. Let's put it that way. And it was a person I was working with and her brother who was a brain surgeon um, actually happened to have a brain tumor himself. And it happened to be in the same area of the brain um, where I had my problem in the fourth ventricle. And so some of the symptoms were quite similar. So she looked at me, thought about her brother, looked at me, you know, he was back to doing brain surgery at the time. So it was a very positive story. So she, she shared it with me and she goes, don't freak out or anything, but um, I think you have a brain tumor. And I was heading home for the weekend. I was living in Boston and she said, so don't come back until you have um, an MRI. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so that's how my diagnosis happened. And I'm happy to say that was, um, I was pretty relieved. I know that's a weird way of describing um, how one would feel when <laughs> you get a brain tumor diagnosis. I mean, I was scared to death too. And, you know, yes, I looked at my scan and then went into the bathroom and proceeded to throw up. Um, I thought it was pretty, pretty disgusting because there was this huge ball in the back of my head and there were all these like fingers going out and, and, um, but really made me sick as I said, oh, you know, um, what are all those lines? You know, because they kept saying that white dot is your tumor, that white dot is your ankle, what are all that? And then, and then this is what the doctor honestly said to me was, you know, well, that's the rest of your brain, meaning that's where your brain has been displaced and it's all squished. Mm -hmm. uh, at that point, the brain tumor had gotten pretty big. But anyway, that's my um, diagnosis story. Um, I think everyone has one. Um, and I look back and think, you know, how could I have even tolerated all that? But um, that was a, the beginning of the road back to health for me. Yeah. And yeah. getting health at UCSF. I guess the relief was at least there was a an, an answer exactly. to why you were the way you were. Exactly. So even though most people, like you say, are devastated by the diagnosis, in your case, it was a little bit like, oh, here's the answer to why I've been this way. Yes. And it sounds like you went through very successful treatment, thank goodness. And, you know, it's yes. decades later, which is fantastic. But it's nice to live out, outlive your doctors. You know, everybody <laughs> that treated me initially, except a couple of residents who are still not really at UC itself, but still around. But um, and then Dr. Chang came in the picture who, you know, has followed me for many, many years. But it really is nice when um when you outlive or, you know, everybody retires yeah. <laughs> that you went with. I certainly didn't think that was going to be the case when I got handed the initial diagnosis. Sure. And, and um, what would you say, you know, because part of our survivorship program focus is really about how do you live well, right? And what would you say is the hardest part of your recovery phase? You know, when you try to reintegrate back into your life, because I remember when we had the first discussions about the survivorship program, and we talked about how it was really difficult for patients, for example, in their 20s, when they've finally launched from their parents, they're <laughs> finally independent. And then all of a sudden this happens and you're back to 
being with your family, of course, because they need to take care of you, which is wonderful. But your cohort of friends are now moving forward in their trajectory of life, and you're kind of stuck again. And then you have to reintegrate. So what did you think was the hardest part? And how did you overcome that? Wow, there were so many hard parts. Certainly being that zapped back into my parents' home was was one of them because they had certain ideas about what was going to make me um, get well. But I was 24, so of course I, you know, thought I knew everything. So some of the difficult things for me um, were very physical, right? Because it was in the back of my head. I didn't have great balance, and but somehow, you know. So it was right when mountain biking, you know, came out. So I remember thinking, okay, I want to go biking, but you know, the idea of these tiny little tires was not going to work for me. So I thought, okay, I'm going to get a fat tire bike and a mountain bike, and try on that. And you know, I fell over many, many times. I mean, I fell over even trying to play tennis, putting my arm out, you know, and forget about water skiing and snow skiing and all the things that I loved. And I think one of the hardest parts was to realize I was going to have to relearn some of those things again. Um, But I was going to have to do it without my parents overprotecting me because I was, um, you know, technically an adult, even though being back in their home was um, kind of put me in, in, in a position of, okay, well, I'm their kid again. So um, doing those things were super important to me. Um, I think maybe um, frustrating myself was part of the process. I mean, I didn't have balance. So what did I try to learn how to do, which was Windsor. That was, I mean, I relearned how to water ski and snow ski and everything because I knew how to do them. There was some muscle memory there, but, but doing things that I had never done before that required balance. Um, and, you know, I'd be sitting in the windsurfing class and I'd be writing down everything. They're like, you don't have to write it down, just feel it. And I'm like, I can't feel it. You know, I just tip over, you know, there must be a way, a trick. Like, do I push on my left toe or my right toe to kind of right myself when I'm in this state? And I think, I think that was really important to me to try and do things that I wanted to do um, that were important for my healing. Um, so I think that was that was one part that was hard. Um, and to be honest with you, I sort of powered through it at first. I was feeling like I was going to do everything. I was going to be the power patient. I was going to do everything that I possibly could to get well and stay well. So I read, you know, everybody brought me these self-help books on surviving cancer and, um, or they gave me these books on, you know, other people like falling rock climbing and how did they, what was their journey back to being positive and everything. And I read all these psychology books and I finally got to be that psychologist I wanted to be (laughs) because I read enough books. And so I, I just did, 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 did. Like I joined that patient empowerment support group. I, I did everything I was supposed to do to be the perfect patient. Um, but I have to say what I didn't do uh, was feel. I think I did all these things to um, help me cope. But what I didn't do was take the time to say, you know, what was it that I just went through? You know, I was pretty wiped out about that. And I think part of it was I couldn't do it too soon. I didn't really go through the feeling stage, which was my hardest stage until about five years later, which I wouldn't recommend <laughs> waiting that long. But you know, for me, that's, that's when it was. I mean, I think that we all um, process things when we're supposed to. I went to these support groups that said, okay, come on, feel, 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 you know, pound pillows, do something, you know, but I wasn't there yet. I mean, I was 24. I hadn't had kids, um, wasn't married. You know, I had a whole life to live. And I think that I couldn't feel my feelings at first. I think that I had to protect myself. And I don't think there was necessarily anything wrong with that. But the hardest period for me was when they sort of exploded. And I'll tell you why that happened. Um, I became a patient again. Um, Now I'm not your patient, but um, I had my jaw broken uh, by my dentist accidentally um, when they were taking out my wisdom tooth, uh, which is a risk of surgery, right? But you just really don't think you're gonna come out with it. And it wasn't even that, you know, they patronized me, said some people are good with pain, other people aren't, you know, just tough it out. And eight days later, you know, after going into his office three times and never getting treatment, I found out, that I had a broken jaw and that turned into um, a bone marrow infection that they couldn't control. So there was many, many surgeries that um, to wire my teeth, unwire my teeth, fix the 
infection, you know, why are my teeth on, why are my teeth cut it out? And, you know, so anyway, um, I had my jaws wired for like five months and that was really hard because I lost a lot of weight. And what do people think? It's like, oh my God, Sherry's sick again. So they automatically thought, you know, that it was my cancer that had come back. A lot of people that didn't know me. And, um, you know, before, you know, when my jaw was wired, then they realized, okay, maybe it was something else. But when they first saw me, and I think that being a patient again, and especially that situation, I had anger about what happened and then not getting proper treatment and then not being able to do anything about it. And I won't go into all those, you know, legal details, but I mean, it was just a nightmare basically. And I tapped into anger, real anger, which I had never felt ever in my life. I'm not an angry person. And I think that opened the floodgates. And I think that once I started feeling angry, it was uncontrollable. And yes, I had a bad situation. I had something to be angry about, but not the level of anger I felt that I was feeling. And I think what was going on, if I had to look back on it, was that all that anger that I that that I didn't feel about having my happy-go-lucky, you know, early 20s living in New York life and then living in Boston, starting a company, the, you know, that went on to be a public company without me. Um, you know, I had a lot of anger that I never felt before. So it, yes, it was triggered by being angry at someone, a different situation, but what it did was all those, I think all those feelings of anger that I had stuffed inside and pushed down. It's kind of like when you have a ball and you're pushing it in a pool and you try to hold it down underneath the water and it goes flying up like twice as high as it should. I think that's what happened. And then after the anger, uh, and I'll probably even get sad talking about it today. I went through this huge period of sadness, like a very long time. Um, I think what you're describing is, is, is so many emotions and a lot of it is about loss and grief, really, yeah. right? An expression yeah. of loss and grief of a life that you didn't have anymore or couldn't, couldn't see as the way it was supposed to be. And it's that grieving, I think, that comes out in this anger, probably, it sounds like for you, uh, that just got triggered by this other event. Um, yeah, no, it's exactly what happened. And I kept saying, you know, I think what I realized, just like that situation, that I just couldn't seem to get over the fact that this dentist did it, wouldn't talk to me and blah, 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 blah. I just couldn't, like everybody said, you're a nice person, just let go of it. You know, you're fine, you're healthy now, you're gaining your weight back. You know, it's not a permanent thing, just let it go. But it was so kind of unjust, the whole thing and the whole yeah. thing about. And I think, I think what I realized was I could not get, get over cancer either. You know, it right. was always gonna be a part of me. Mm -hmm. And, just like I had to accept that this other situation happened to me, I had to, I had to get to the point where I really felt that, that I could integrate the fact that I had cancer into who I was. I didn't have right. to get over it. I could actually have it be a part of me and that was okay. Yeah. And then I could actually grow from that challenge. And, and, and I realized all the, all the, blessings, I guess you'd say that came into my life because I had been sick, the incredible people that I met that, you know, thank goodness I got out of business and I got back to counseling psychology, which is what I always wanted to do, which is what I'm doing today. You know, that yeah. was a huge gift. I learned how to communicate so much more authentically with people in my life. I was able to ask for help, which I never had been able to do before. Um, I mean, the, the level of richness and the connection that I had with not just other cancer patients, but with anybody that had gone through anything in their life that felt like you said, that sense of loss, felt that um, disconnection from people. I mean, I was in my 20s. I didn't know anybody that had brain tumor, for God's sakes, or anybody that even had cancer at that point in my life. Now I know, you know, many, many, but at the time I didn't know anybody. Mm -hmm. And I think I felt very alone yeah. and very isolated. I mean, I'll just... I'll just tell you one thing, another one of those moments that, you know, kicked me into my feelings is I was on vacation, windsurfing, something like that, that I love to do. And there was a random guy, you know, that I met on vacation was part of this group that I was hanging out with on the beach. And he just asked me a simple question, which he meant nothing by it. He just said, well, why are you so different? I mean, in a good way, he meant it to be positive. And I'm like, I just like burst into tears and I cried uncontrollably for like five hours. I'm like, 
wow, that was weird. What was that about? And, and I realized that's it. You know, I have felt different. I felt different from everybody. I felt like nobody, I could relate to nobody. I felt that. And, and, and when he said that, I realized there was that sadness of not being just carefree and fun and happy like everybody else. And, you know, I mean, he felt terrible. He didn't mean anything by it, but, but it was just, it struck that chord. And I mean, I would cry all the time at movies. I mean, I like somehow, like I could watch a movie about cancer or a movie about somebody with a brain tumor. And I wouldn't shed a tear because I was protected, but it would be something else. It would be something else sad in a movie and it would like trigger feeling. And I, and I just realized, I mean, thank God I was in graduate school of counseling psychology at the time, because I realized, you know, there's, there's a process that you go through. And sometimes it's not like they were very convincing, you know, like as if we were working with clients, but I was probably doing therapy myself in graduate school is that, you know, your body naturally protects you. You're not going to get to this point of feeling so overwhelmed, probably. It might be scary. It might be different than what you've experienced, but you're probably not going to fall apart if you just let it flow through you. But so it's how do you overcome that sort of fear, right? Of facing all of those well, emotions, right? You know, for me, it wasn't a choice. It wasn't like I said one day, oh, I think I'm going to work through my feelings and, you know, get in touch with, you know, this cancer experience that I had. I mean, it literally hit me in the face. Yeah. And... And my project, which we're going to be talking about next, is, is really based on that fact, like, can you fast forward the process? Can you help people? I, I've always thought that they're, they're, it might have been a little bit easier to feel the feelings all along. I think that because I waited a while, that, that it zapped me like it did uh, and took much longer, I think, in the end to, to work through it. Yeah. So that, that's why I started my project, which we'll talk about, is to, to really help people bit by pit bit by bit, you know, work through things only when they're ready. But if they are ready, you know, to have a tool to do that. Yeah. So tell us about um, digging deep and what, you know, how did you come about, you know, even creating this and thinking of, of this as a way to help other, especially young children um, go through an illness in a way that they can learn from it and grow and, and help themselves. So let me um, show, the, show those of you who are not familiar, this is a book and um, it looks really different than your typical um, workbook that you would receive in the hospital or um, by seeing a social worker or something or child life specialist, which are typically, you know, either a spiral bound black and white notebook with a few questions in it or are, um, you know, stapled sheets of, paper, you know, asking you to either draw color or write about, you know, what you're going through. And so I had been um, a volunteer uh, counselor working with patients and families. And I'm like, okay, there's got to be a better way. There's got to be something that's inviting, something that captures kids' stories so that they become even more proud of them. Because when I would talk with kids one-on-one, -on -one, they were very proud of their stories. Um, and they did have a lot of feelings. They just maybe weren't sharing what was going on. And so, so my solution was to come up with this book and I'm just gonna, oh, it's a little hard on Zoom guys, but uh, it was called Digging Deep and it's just loaded with beautiful art and with the questions. So it captures kids and stuff. Like, this is a question about anger. It's kind of a dark piece and it looks a bit angry. Um, this is, which one is this? I'm sorry, I can't read that play out. Oh, so this is about listening, talking, listening, and hearing. So this book was like loaded with questions that kids wonder and worry about. Not just kids, anybody. But to be honest, once this book came out, people would see it around my house like, oh my God, could I have a copy? I need this book. And parents were asking, is it okay if I have an extra copy? Because I want to do the book, you know, it was given to my kid or my kid's too young, but could I keep it? You know, I had people in their, you know, not everybody would tell me their age, but, you know, by, by their life experience, they were sharing with me were significantly older than who I designed this book for. But it was, um, which really gave me the idea that I was sort of onto something is that people need a safe place where they can work through what they need to work through, but also go back and reread what they've written where they can, kind of get that self-reflection, that self-awareness um, and continue on the next day. Like I told people with the book, 
you don't have to start at the beginning and work all the way through question by question. I mean, flip through it, find a piece of art that resonates with you and start there. You know, the art's going to inspire the feelings to come. And yeah, that was one of the things I noticed about your book. There's a lot of empty space, not only for journaling, but yeah. also for creativity and to express you yourself. In it, you can draw. Yeah. And, and, and I would talk, just flip through it. Just be random. Just pick it up and open it. And maybe that question is the one you're supposed to answer or flip through it. Find art that you like. Find yeah a page that has a question that you like. If the question doesn't really apply to you, cross it out and change the words. That's how it's supposed to be word. It's it's like after my journal came out, there was a journal, rec breakfast journal, but I love it because if you guys have seen it, it's all about how can you destroy your journal enough and do all those funny things to it. And it, it's, it's sad, it's not that you're destroying the journal, it's that by putting your words in it and by crossing things out and making it your own, you're, you're adding to the beauty of it, right? Yeah. And I wanted, it looks like a coffee table book. It doesn't look like a book that's a therapy book. And so that's what I wanted to do. So we started with this book and it's a philanthropy project. We put it on Amazon only so that people could find it if, if it wasn't one of the hospitals or one of the, um, the nonprofit organizations where I, I gave it away for free. But the, um, but the idea was that, that people could get it and it, you know, for those that it was right, it was really right. I mean, I would receive emails all the time saying um, how it's helped them. And some of them came from teenage boys, like not somebody you think would write in a colorful journal, but they were they're, they're like, I remember getting this, this um, email from, from a guy who was about 18. And he's like, you wrote this just for me, didn't you? How did you know? You know, wow. those kind of things. And, and that was an 18 year year old boy, not who I would think necessarily be the first person that I would hand this journal to. But fortunately, um, the child life specialist didn't make a judgment on that and, and just gave it to, to anyone that they felt could benefit. And sometimes, you know, teenage girls who you would think maybe would be the perfect person to give it to can't stand it because, yeah. you know, they're too closed internally, whatever. Well, that's fine, you know, but the idea was to give it to kids so that they could use it if if and when they were ready. And so I, I use a lot of words um, to talk about the past because, um, because the book is in the past. What happened was um, it became very popular and I only printed um, 35,000 copies, which seemed like the most copies I could ever imagine. It was warehouses delivery i get ten thousand at a time ship from Hong Kong. i never thought i'd you know quote get rid of them fast enough um and they all disappeared in in two years i started to panic i only had about half a year's books left at the rate that they were going out the door so i thought i have to come up with a better idea i have to um come up with a different idea that uh, is scalable so of course i thought of digital so i was going to make um make it into a digital journal that you could just download and I engaged um, a couple of my digital girlfriends with a heart, as I call them, my tech gals with a heart. And they said, um, well, who do you think really needs this the most? And I said, well, definitely teens and young adults. Um, there's lots of stuff in hospital for little kids. Um, and this was never a little kid's book, but it was younger. It was like 10 to 16, 18 year old, something like that. And, and I said, I really wanna make something for, for older teens and going into adulthood you know, that helps them take, you know, the popular, I mean, not popular, because not everybody knows them, but the principles of positive psychology that are so important that they would be able to, um, to understand in a self-help book if they were reading. I mean, they're not even going to bookstores anymore, let alone reading self-help books. So I'm like, okay, so how can we make popular psychology popular? I mean, how are positive psychology popular? How can we make it cool? and hip and fun to like work on yourself. So that was my challenge. Uh, to well, my I, yeah, I love how you're, you're sort of thinking of the benefits of the book, but yeah. how you can make that sort of intentionally a tool for, for everybody who, who may have access to it as opposed to a hard copy. So, so I mean, I know you have some exciting uh, videos and some examples from your, your app, which is the Shadow's Edge. And we're really excited to hear about it. So maybe um, tell us a little bit about that part of, of you know, yeah. how you extended from so, digging so, deep. So thanks. Um, like I said, it we really came out of the book, which started with um, trying to help people find themselves, but also connect to others. I mean, I think that there's, 
most of us have at least one person and hopefully more in our lives that want to connect to us, want to help us. Um, but often they don't know how to do that because they only can see kind of from their own perspective. I, I think of my own mom, you know, she would do all these things and it would drive me crazy because it's not what I needed. But, you know, it wasn't her fault. If I didn't tell her what I needed, how on earth was she going to know? And so I, um, I'm like, okay, well, I better make a tool like, like the Digging Deep book that can help kids communicate. But uh, first of all, a lot of us don't even understand what we're thinking and feeling. So first of all, I wanted to create something that would help them identify those thoughts and feelings, but then um, also to be able to communicate them and, and to realize it's okay not to be okay. And, and people are gonna be, be there um, for them. And I think that the reason I chose technology is, I mean, think about it. I mean, I have teens now, I didn't at the time. I mean, I, they were younger, <laughs> I did have kids, but they were younger because um, the concept of the game started about three years ago. And we decided to make a digital game around. So my, after I put it out there to my tech gals, I said, well, what do you think I should do? You know, how, how can I make this digital journal? And they're like, okay, first of all, you don't want to make a digital journal. You need to make a digital game. You want to reach teens and young adults. You need to make a game. You need to somehow make this fun to learn about yourself. And I'm like, okay, now how are we going to do that? So I thought, I thought, okay, you know, let's give it a try. Let's go to a few workshops, see, see what we can come up with. And so, um, I thought I'd show a video and some, some things about the game to help everyone understand it because it's very understand, hard to understand how can a book become a game. So I thought we'd start the video and it looks like it's pulled up here. Thank you, Naomi. It's been hit just like we've been hit by this diagnosis, this illness. It makes me think of a black period, a dark period in your life, and you're at the edge of it. You want to get out of it, but you're not there yet. The quest of the player in the game is to bring Shadow's Edge back to life. He does that through journaling and through creative expression. Through the metaphor, really, of a city that's been somehow decimated or destroyed, you have the power to reconstruct it and reconstruct it, both its beauty, but also its meaning. The game is going to ask you some questions so that you can dig deep and understand what's going on inside. Do I really love myself? What do I want my doctors to know about me? And what am I not, what am I not saying? Shadow's Edge is like a person-centered therapy without the therapist, if you will. It's important to express yourself. You need a little more than just a distraction or a little bit more than medical medicine. It'll help you in so many ways, like more ways that you can possibly understand. Oh, great, thanks Sam, for showing that. So, um, I guess I could just describe the game a little bit um, and then we'll have time for questions at the end. But um, so if you think of it, like a lot of times people say, well, like if you go to therapy, you've got all these, like you try to contain your feelings within the walls of um, the therapist's office. And in a way it's kind of the same thing. It gives, like with the book where you put the words down and instead of this kind of overwhelming massive, I, you know, I feel terrible, I feel overwhelmed, I feel, some days like I can't go on or, you know, whatever those difficult feelings are to get it down. It's, and to be able to describe it and label it and put it somewhere. And in this case, in the game, you put it both in the journal that you create, which has very similar questions to, to what the book did, not exactly the same, but uh, very similar. And to be able to, um, to put, to also create graffiti um, we have uh, the reason you could kind of see in the background of that video. Uh, the other thing they do that they couldn't do, like here, you, there's plenty of blank spaces where you can both write as well as create art. And some kids were doing that, creating art. But sometimes when you have to do it in a book, it's like, am I an artist? You know, is it going to look like it's supposed to look? But, you know, graffiti never looks like anything, really. Um, so it's perfect. That's why one of the reasons why we picked graffiti as a metaphor in the game. Uh, another reason is because 
what is a graffiti artist really doing? Well, they're they're putting themselves up there. They have something that they need to say that really needs to be heard. Um, and that was exactly what wasn't happening. But these, a lot of these kids, they were kind of putting up the stiff upper lip or they were hiding behind masks that weren't really them. Um, sometimes, not always. Uh, and part of that reason is, you know, why does that happen? Well, you know, they want to sometimes protect themselves. Maybe they feel like if they start feeling, sometimes they can't feel, which was my situation. Sometimes it's because they're protecting their parents, actually, because yeah. they don't want to see them cry. And they, they want to hold it together for, for themselves and for other people. And, and so we thought by, by creating a game, um, it would make it fun. It would be something that they would want to come back to. Like, you know, I have got young teens myself and they'll like jump on their phone to play like a little bit of a game for like when they have 30 seconds to play or one minute to play. I'm like, why do you guys even bother turning on your phones? And they're like, oh, I'm just, you know, they call that casual game. You know, I'm just being casual about I'm just playing this game that doesn't really matter just to do something. And and I didn't I didn't see that as being the best opportunity for I mean, it's not a bad thing to, for kids to entertain themselves, but at the same time, why can't that that little bit of jumping on, jumping on, jumping on, you know, be into a game that was actually teaching them something? Um, and, yeah, and one of the other things I think um, that has evolved with this game organically almost is this sort of sense of community. Because one of the things you pointed out earlier was that sense of isolation and how you're going through this by yourself. It feels like it. And um, how do we help support each other? And I know one of the really great things that, that Naomi and the team has done with the survivorship program is this thrivers group um, where you know, they meet every week and it's, it's this uh, wonderful group that uh, share experiences, support each other. And, um, and it sounds like this app also has that opportunity, right? For sharing and community. Yeah. So, so yeah, I'm glad you, you brought that up. And so we do that through uh, the sharing of graffiti. We feel that people's journal entries are their yeah. own personal and private uh, thoughts. Um, however, we want to make the game fun. And most um, games these days that draw in teens um, and young adults, everybody that plays games, they like to play in community. They like to play with each other. And it's not, and so we're, we have all kinds of things um, when we finish raising our money that we're going to do to add to how they can actually play together. But where we are right now in the game is like, if you could think of it like Instagram, and then we're going to show you some of these images that they posted. We have a community where, um, well, right next to where almost every question is in the game, there's a place to make art, whether it's a billboard or a wall or on a garbage can or, you know, whatever, there are lots of places to make art. And um, we give them the tools to do that. You saw it a little bit in the video, but not much. But, you know, we, we give them colors, we give them stencils, we give them stickers, you know, all kinds of things to make this graffiti. And then they can share, it, even if it's just one little corner of the graffiti that they just made, but if that's what they're willing to share, they can blow it up and, um, and share it. And then they can get feedback from other people that are also in the app that are playing the game. Not at that exact time, they can come by any time and, and give you a comment. And instead of just being a simple emoji, it's usually things like we have pre-selected some responses that the kids are allowed to give the other person. So just like picking an emoji, um, you're, you're able to say, hang in there. You know, I've been there, done that. I'm there for you. Um, those type of comments, all positive comments. And if you're on the receiving end of that and you see this community of young people that are playing that are there you know to connect with you I, it was important to me to make something where like when i was sick i wanted to meet somebody 24 with a career plexus carcinoma tumor that lived in california blah 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 well you know what are the chances of that happening how how rare was my tumor dr chang very really rare <laughs> never to this day 34 years later have i met a single person let alone my age uh and, and all that. So um, I think that's, I think, you know, it's pretty normal for people wanting to find somebody that's just like them who's been through it. Yeah. And, to learn from yeah. them. Yeah. 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 And I think, and, and I think sometimes that happens, but I think that if we look just at how can people connect, not based on their exact diagnosis. I mean, is a person, you know, I, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you, this actually happened through the game. So I'll just use this example. There was a, a time when, um, a young person 
who was playing Shadow's Edge uh, because it's for not just for cancer, it's not for brain tumors, it's not even anymore for kids with chronic and serious illness, which I can tell you about. I mean, yes, we have that version, but it doesn't need to be because it's about feelings, it's about the process, it's about the journey. And so this is, um, so this is what happened. These were um, two kids that had um, spent a lot of time in hospitals, uh, both boys, both at, you know around 18 or 20. One had had his leg amputated because of a sarcoma and one had been in a biking, a mountain biking right, accident right. and lost his yeah. Yeah, mobility. And they connected with each other based on something about mobility and shadow's edge. Sure. They, they can, you know, like we don't do it automatically. They have to, we have, we monitor the site and we can make those introductions if, you know, both parties would like that. And they ended up connecting, not because they had this exact same thing. I mean, they did have a similar experience of mobility, but that feeling of loss and that feeling of, you know, how do I go forward from here? Who am I? You know, mm -hmm. one was a big mountain biker. One was like um, also a sports star in his high school team. And, wow. and you know, so they connected. So, so like when I think about it, I think it's very siloed, the whole medical community. Like if you have this disease, you go to this website. If you have this, if you have brain cancer, you go here. If you have cancer, you go well over here. If you have a different kind of cancer, you go over here. But what about somebody who also is going through that exact thing, but doesn't have cancer? They're going through it because right. they've, they're going through those same feelings because their parents got divorced, for example, or, you know, that feeling of how do I go on with my life is the same. You know, what is my option B? It's mm -hmm. the same regardless of what gets in there. And so that's why what we've done in the game is to try and broaden the language. So, so we still have the, the medical version, we call it, but, but then we also have one that, we're, that just talks about when, like for kids with COVID, when life turns upside down yeah. and, and you yeah. need to get right back up and, and you have to see what have I gained from this difficult situation and how can I turn around and help others yeah. um, get through it. So, so I think, yeah, I think your point about um, helping others is one I wanted to focus on because Sherry, you have used, you know, what your journey has given you to give back so much to the kids, to the teens. And I know that the books were free. The app is free. I mean, the giving that you have um, shared with us too, for the vision of this program, this Cherry Sobrato, you know, Brisson survivorship program for our patients um, is, is really something again, that you're help, you've helped us to help our patients. So maybe tell us a little bit about what you saw the vision for that program to be like. And, and I remember talking with you in the exam room <laughs> about, you know, how, how can we do this because of, of learning from what you experience as a 24 year old with this disease, but, um, you know, having to get back into life. And um, so maybe just share with us a little bit about that as well. Sure. Um, well, I can only speak from my own personal experience, um, but for me, surviving wasn't the hardest part. Um, you know, my doctors helped me do that. Uh, to me, it was like what I said, the emotional side of things. And so one of my, my visions, I would say, is to, well, first, first I shared your vision, which was to have everything in one place. I think one of the most important things um, for me as a patient was was being able to take charge. Even though the doctors were taking care of me, I prided myself on taking charge of whatever I could, which wasn't very often very much. But I mean, I think having everything in one place so that people can feel that it's integrated so they can choose it, what they want to, to do for themselves um, in terms of, I mean, there's a the recommend follow-up, of course, but, um, but to, to sort of as a survivor, you know, you're in a different position than a doctor when you're going through active treatment, when somebody's telling you what to do all the time, you have a lot more choices to make about mm -hmm. what to do or how you're going to adapt or how you're even going to think about how you're going to adapt. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, how we think about things, you know, is our choice too. And so I just think that our healthcare system doesn't always put everything in one place. And I think that that was, um, something that you said that really resonated with me. I think the emotional support side of what you wanted to do um, really resonated with me. Um, and then, you know, this was something, you know, it would, 
it's my dream that something that can start at UCSF, which really, you know, I credit for saving my life, um, could become a model to help other brain tumor centers, to help other cancer patients. Um, I think that the brain tumor um, community has its own unique challenges that are, make it different, uh, I think, than the general cancer community. And there's certainly breast cancer groups and things like that, but you know, you're not always going to feel like it's your tribe. And I think having a survivorship program, you know, specifically for brain tumors patients who have, you know, often deficits, often challenges, often recurrences, you know, just all the things that, that, that happened to us that I think that, that that was great. And I just think being a national model, being online, having programming online, I mean, maybe a little bit more so even though we weren't right now in the times of COVID, but, but I think, um, I think being national and maybe even international, I mean, you've presented what we're doing at international conferences. And I think that's amazing. So that's, I think part of my original vision. Well, thank you again for that. I mean, I think one of the biggest things that we're really, really proud of is the cognitive clinic that we have, the the recovery, rehab, cognitive rehab, and sort of um, really paying attention to emotional and sort of behavioral changes, um, as well as the sort of processing of information that comes along with challenges of someone who has a brain tumor. So uh, again, we are so grateful that you you, you saw how important this was. And um, it, it's really a tribute to you uh, that we have such a program. We have a wellness webinar as, as Naomi pointed out. So just um, a couple of last questions about, you know, what advice might you have for someone who's been diagnosed with a new diagnosis? And, um, you know, what, what would you tell someone today? Well, I kind of alluded to it earlier, but um, for me, it was, um, to receive, how to let somebody take care of me. I was always a giver in relationships. And so it depends on who you are, but I mean, for me, that was an important lesson um, to not have to be strong all the time and to yeah. um, to let people take care of me. And I have to say, I have a current injury right now um, with my leg and I'm letting people take care of me. I mean, it was a lifelong lesson that I learned, but. Um, from somebody that had always been the, the one taking care of. I think that was something that was Im- important to me. Um, and the other thing that, that I mentioned was, you know, the importance of letting people know what you need. Right. Um, Communication. And, and to know yourself well enough to know what it is. I mean, mm-hmm. I think it, it's pretty easy to say, oh, well, just tell somebody what you need. Well, how can you do that if you don't know mm-hmm. what you need? And for me, that was a, an exercise in and of itself to figure out. Um, I wasn't particularly good at it at the time that I was sick. I mean, it was something that I, a skill that I learned, I guess you'll say afterwards um, to, to be able to identify what, what I needed, but then to um, kind of the, the second part is, well, when you're over the crisis stage and you're getting towards that, you know, survivorship stage, what do you right. do to, you know, um, for me, it was about structuring my life. Like once I figured out what my needs were and they were needs that other people didn't need to meet. These are needs like my need for creativity. Well, then what did I do? Well, then I won't go into details, but I had all, ki- all kinds of things that I lived my life creatively now. And that was a conscious choice. I needed to be surrounded by happy, motivated people. I was a caregiver type and I had a right. lot of people with a lot of problems in my life and I was tired of it. And I wanted to make some positive changes. And and so I, I like all these people that were traveling all over the world or doing these incredible things. I'm like, I want to do that. I want to be like that. I want to have these people in my life. And then I did. And yeah. I'm doing all the things, you know. So, so like, I wanted to take chances. I wanted to be more athletic, you know, all these things that I learned that I needed to do. But then I had to make the effort, like baby steps. Like, how do I go one step at a time so that I can um, structure my life to meet my needs? And I think that was... And, and I had to, and it wasn't a straight path. I mean, I had to wander around in the dark a lot of the time and, and be able to um, get there. So um, yeah. does that answer your question? Absolutely. And I think what we have the, this program for is to help people navigate sometimes those times where they yeah. feel that the light is low and it's dark, you know, that we're here to try to get them back um, into the light and to, to feel well, whether it's with um, Dr. Abrams, um, 
you know, three classes he has now, or whether it's our exercise program, or, you know, nutrition, uh, all of those things, uh, ways to sort of feel like you have control and to take charge of your life in a way that is as positive as possible, even though we know how hard it is. Um, so part of part of that is the vision I think you shared with us as to why this program even is here. And, and we're so proud to be able to do that with you. Um, certainly it's a partnership that we have with you that we really uh, value. So um, Sherry, thank you so much. Um, there are already a few questions in the chat. So I'm gonna go ahead and ask them to you. Um, one of the ones people are asking is, ab is about what kind of brain cancer you had, because obviously having survived 34 years in, and so forth. Um, so it was a um, fourth ventricle tumor. That's where it's based, which is in the back of your head. Um, there's kind of a lot of dead space back there. So, um, so except for balance and breathing and a few other important things. Yeah, that, like your brain stem. <laughs> that goes on back there. It's kind of a lot of dead space. So it was a specifically, I'm sure you probably, I'd be surprised. I hope somebody on the call has, and, but it would be good to, um, to meet somebody I never have, but it was, um, correct me if my pronunciation is wrong, Dr. Chang, but choreoplexus carcinoma yeah. tumor. So this tumor uh, actually, just for the, the people who are on the call, uh, tends to be seen in children more so. So usually younger than a 24 year old. Um, and so, and the, the treatment consists of surgery and uh, radiation and chemotherapy. So it's a, it's a very intensive treatment for this uh, type of tumor. Uh, so, but thank you, Sherry, for, for sharing that with us. The other question that came up was, you know, you, there are lots of people on the app. It's wonderful. Uh, but is there someone responding to any questions the kids might have? Is there a, a two-way street kind of thing in terms of what they post? And is there any sort of monitoring that occurs of yes. what they're doing on the site? That's a good question. So we, um, we do monitor it, but we don't ask for open questions. So like I said, when there's feedback given, it's always a matter of choices of what you can make. But when they post things in their art, I want to take a minute and run through a few slides to, to show you. Um, so maybe sure. Naomi, you could bring those up and while we're, we're answering the question, but uh, so why don't we skip the first couple if you could, and we'll go back to those if we have time and just get, yeah, well, yeah. And then skip that one. Nope. Oh. Yes, perfect. So this is a sample of, uh, it's shaped like a cell phone because it, of course kids play, for, play it on their cell phone. This is a picture of, you know, we have somebody, these are what we call screenshots. And when kids take a screenshot, we actually give them a little camera in their phone where they can go up to their graffiti and take a shot of it and share it, like just like on Instagram. So this is one that we wouldn't be flagged, for example, for, for somebody needing extra help because it's just some really kind of cool graffiti that they made. They didn't put a caption on it. So we probably wouldn't worry about this one. And, and I can say we have thousands of these images and we monitor it. I have, um, we have staff, it was built, the game was built in Amsterdam. So fortunately, a lot of my team is in Europe and even in Asia. So we're all in different time zones. So we all take turns and we, we monitor it 24 hours a day. Here's another one. Um, and this one says, I, the caption on it is at the bottom in white and it says, let's see if I can even read it. Um, what hate that people, uh, do to me sometimes. That's kind of what they put with this picture that they made. So they, you know, don't judge people when you don't know what they're going through. I mean, that's a real feeling for people, but that's not one that's going to be alarming either. Um, and none of these that I'm showing you are going to be alarming. And the point is people don't put up alarming stuff. So we only can see what we can see. Um, there's been like, for example, I, I myself, they didn't realize it was me because I changed my screen name all the time just to make sure the system works. I had put up something that I felt was positive and it was with rainbows and everything, but the words that I put in the graffiti said something like the end is near. And I meant that positive, like I'm getting over, like I'm almost there. And, and what it meant to the staff was, oh my God, this person's gonna kill themselves. And, and on the back end, we can see what, that's why we have it be 13 plus. So we can contact the people immediately if we need to and need to be seen. This says, um, anyway, who are you without your mask? Um, this was something a young person made and posted it. So beautiful, the colors. 
yeah so they so this is cool so you can use our our you know kind of stock stickers but then you can modify them like that person felt like they wanted to take out the eyeballs so they did mm -hmm. uh, and make it kind of different this one says uh, the ghost i hide behind so people don't see the real me yeah so there's a ghost and there's a person that they hide behind um so it's a lot of expression like here's another one you know the worst part is insulting myself whenever I feel depressed. Um, so that if they're, if they just post something like that, we're not going to jump all over it. Um, uh, sometimes they interchange sad with depressed. Here's another one. Um, that's just kind of funny. You got to just loosen up sometimes. Um, so we get all kinds of things being posted. Let's, let's whip through a couple more. And here it says, um, I like this one, my illness, it, is really invisible but if you look hard enough you can see how it's changed my life yeah so and i think that one actually resonates a lot with brain tumor patients because yeah. physically they can look fine but yeah. if they may be having difficulty with seizures or cognitive changes that's not visible to people and i know that they have a hard time when for example it, at work when they're you know expected to perform it exactly the same way because they look fine Mm -hmm. when it's hard for them because they're struggling. And I think that's a really, really, uh, you know, that's, that says so much. And here's just a sample of somebody just playing around with our graffiti fonts. And that's yeah. cool because yeah. a part of, I think, what's therapeutic about the game is just having fun and just yeah. play. I mean, kids need play. Okay, you can. And this one, let's see. So, oh, so this is about inner dialogue. And let's see if I can read it. It takes courage to notice um, how tough our inner dialogue can be. Step one, inner kindness. So that's you know what a young person wrote because you know it's fun. So so the ones that look like they're great drawings, those are actually stickers of you know comic comical stickers uh, that look like our characters that resemble our characters, but are made like more of a character of a characters in there. So that's very simple. I mean, yeah, a young person can make that piece of graffiti in about maximum one minute. Wow. You know, you pick stickers, you, you know, punch yeah. the colors, not me, it would take a little bit longer, but you know, they, they're super fast. So, um, so there's a lot, and maybe we can, um, Naomi, mean, if you could bring the slides back, we can easily click through, click through those other three to tell you a little bit more, more about the game. And then I'd love to talk more questions if people have them. So this is, um, kind of what what we show our young people this is kind of the style of our um social media posts and things like that and i just wanted to, uh, to talk very quickly because i think everybody can relate to this why do we call the game shadow's edge so uh usually that's a question i get so i'll go ahead and just answer it and if you think of it at least it felt to me like this cancer was always this shadow you know hanging over me like couldn't escape it wherever it went there there it was um, and it was this kind of heaviness, but, um, why we call it shadow's edge is at the edge of that shadow, there, there can be light and light yeah. to me means possibility. Even if you can't get there, you can get, you can start thinking about it. Right. And, and even if you don't know what's going to be over the edge, you know, mm -hmm. there's possibilities and it, it's how to get clear, I guess, to be able to see, to become, you know, the person that you want to be. So, yeah. um, so that's kind of our motto. And then we'll, we'll just flip through quickly. Um, the next one, this one is important. So this gives you a little visual of, of the three stages in the game. And I think it's important because um, the first stage is disruption, which is, you know, really being kicked in the face. And you do move through the through the stages sequentially, but once you you know open them all up, you can you can hang out wherever you want to hang out. The second one um, is disillusionment. In the first stage, you cope pretty well because you just kind of cope the way you've always been coping. You're just becoming an extreme version of yourself, and it's pretty effective for a while until it doesn't work anymore. And that's a disillusionment stage when you don't know what to do, what what you had done. Even if you're an extreme version of yourself, it still doesn't work. And sometimes people go through it, sometimes they don't. So if they don't relate to that stage, they don't have to hang out in that stage. They can jump to a different stage. And the last stage is discovery. And sometimes even in the worst of times, you can, you can discover something about yourself or, or have a feeling that, you know, 
hey, there's some, like in some weird way, I'm benefiting from the fact, you know, there's something I've learned about myself or there's a, there's a benefit to what I'm going through right now. Um, it may only be a fleeting moment, but you know, there is that flash and that's kind of called the discovery and there'll be discovery moments. And then eventually there'll be more and more of those moments until you're finally in that stage. So, um, so that's what that one is about. And this is just a little bit about um, the impact. Um, and, and this is not like a technical slide that you would see up at a medical conference. I'm sorry about that, but this is our, we wanted to let our players know what they can expect. And that's, this is from our surveys, our very initial surveys when the game first came out uh, and kids only played it a couple of months, what they were, you know, kids were having fun and they were feeling more real and they were understanding people. Um, and it's interesting because really who they're understanding better is themselves because it's not like they're talking to any of these other kids, but they felt like they understood other people better because of that connection piece that you were talking about, Dr. Chang. Mm -hmm. So, um, so good. So that's, yeah. um, that's it. Is there more questions or we can just open it up for. Well, I think we can, we can open it up, but um, again, you're just so inspirational um, in, in taking something that is really hard making it into something so beautiful and so giving uh, to others. And so again, um, just, just beautiful. Um, Thanks. So Naomi, I think you had a couple of questions. Yes, I've just been so enjoying this in the background, listening to you both. Um, it's almost like I'm, I'm, I'm hearing this like one plus one equals three, like both of you together with your passion and inspiration. It's like, it's more than just like both of you together. You've kind of created something that just has kind of expanded. So I'm very humbled to be with both of you and um, just so honored to be part of the, this program. And I just have to say, when you were talking a little bit about the Thriver Group, that's also what happens in the Thriver Group. I feel like, you know, the energy that you're bringing, Sherry, to the world and, and Dr. Chang, you're bringing um, is in that Thriver Group and they bring it to each other and it just, it just expands. So anyway, um, I, there are a couple of questions here that are coming up and, um, I let's see. I think someone would just want missed the name of the app. Um, that oh was, yeah. So it's yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. It's called Shadows Edge, and if you just do a search on you know Google Play or the App Store, you can find it and um, download it for free. So thank you for asking that. And the uh, I might as well say the websites at the same time. It's shadowsedge.com is our kind of younger person site. So or young at heart site, but it's kind of the gritty graffiti, cool and hip site. And that's the stories on that site. We also have a blog, which is part of our community. And we share stories and every single week we blog on the digging deep in the shadow's edge side. And I'll tell you the difference in a second here, but on shadow's edge, it's really written with the uh, idea that the patients are teens or young adults, patients, or now that we've expanded it to being beyond uh, medical situations, um, the players, let's just call them players. It's really for the players themselves. So if you're a player and you wanna see what players are saying, you go to the Shadow's Edge side. Now, if you're a um, someone that's helping and supporting um, a player and also players themselves, older players themselves, because we have, um, I think our oldest player right now is 82. So it certainly doesn't stop at 24. If you can, I'm not very good at playing my own game, but um, for those of you, uh, who are young at heart and really want to play. The questions are just answered at a different level, right? You know, if you're a teen, you answer them at kind of one level. And if you're, you know, an adult who's been, you know, maybe going to therapy for a long time or, or foster youth, sometimes go to therapy for a very long time. So they're going to answer, how, you know, in a very different way than, than maybe a, a, a high school a student that has never considered those kinds of kind of um, personal development topics, you know, will answer it. So it's it's really for everybody. And um, the digging deep, it's it's at diggingdeep.org um, because we are a nonprofit. That's the adult side with dark.com for kids because they don't really get .org. Um, and .org is uh, the spirit of the project. That's digging deep. It has the stories of the founders and. Um, myself and on the shadows edge side it also talks about the game developers and uh, has the other team members um, stories um, but the digging deep side it has a blog uh, specifically for parents for professionals for older siblings for um in old in, in older players so just to, that's to, wonderful because i'm sure that would have been, a, been a question like how can i take part in yeah. it i'm not thank you um and another question is uh oh so 
I think you talked about this a little bit, but how has cancer, how has having cancer changed you for the better? Ah, wow. Uh, <laughs> changed me as an individual, changed my life, because they're two kind of different questions. So I'll, I'll change me as an individual is, I mean, I think the first thing that comes to mind is just not doing what everybody else wants me to do, but doing what what I want to do. Um, and that sounds really selfish. And sometimes I am selfish. I mean, I think that's okay. I don't think I would, I think I was pretty selfless before. And I think a little healthy selfishness is good. And to be, to give myself permission to be that way, you know, to travel if I want to travel, to study what I want to study, to be who I want to be, to tell people off if I want to tell them off, you know? And, and it was interesting because People adjusted. I mean, I wasn't really particularly good at it at the beginning. You know, I was pretty rough around the edges when I was trying on my new personalities, my new ways of being. And, and I remember somebody telling me, and it was some came from a support group, you know, if you just change, people are going to have to respond to it. You know, you don't have to feel trapped in this box that you've always been in before. Not that I was, I had this horrible existence. I didn't, but I did feel like, I couldn't make all the choices that I wanted to make. And, and still to this day, I think, you, you know, people treat me occasionally like my old self and I have to remind them, no, I'm actually, this is really who I am now. And, um, and I have to constantly do that with some, some people, but it was, it's okay. You know, I, I remember when I was leading a support group. So uh, one of the people in my group said, um, well, sometimes, you just have to, and this is her expression, not mine, but I think it's really true, prune your garden. You know, <laughs> like those people around you that don't fit anymore. Well, you don't have to get rid of them entirely, but you don't have to take care of them anymore. You don't have to, you know, drain your own energy. Doing that, you can actually choose to interact with them in a different way. And if you interact with them in a different way, they're forced to interact with you in a different way. Mm. Um, so that we can kind of, I hate the expression because it sounds so new age, but it's, it's true. So it can create our own reality. You know, we, I, I mean, I look at my sister, I mean, for, as an example, I mean, I think that she's, you know, a little bit jealous of how I live my life now, but you know, she has every freedom that I do. It's just whether or not you take it. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, if I had to say one thing, and this is the part about my life that's changed, not me personally, is freedom. If I had to sum up one word that cancer has given me, it's freedom. And it's crazy because people would say like, why on earth would you pick that word? But, you know, it's absolutely in my life, um, hundred percent true is that it gave yeah. me freedom of, to choose the way I wanted to live. Yeah. And, and I think it's also, I think is, is being intentional with how you spend your time, right? Yeah. Cause, yeah, cause life, word. life is so, so busy. We could be spending it doing so many things. Um, but it's really focusing on the priorities and saying, okay, I only have so much time. So how do I really want to spend this time? So it, so I feel good about it, you know? And, um, yeah. I just realized what you said was one of the things when you asked me that question about what was the most difficult period you, I was thinking of period but the most difficult hurdle which I still struggle with today is I always feel like rushed right because right. I think inherently part of me thinks that I don't have enough time mm -hmm. and I remember we had to pick one false belief this was in my another support group where it was more psychoeducationally oriented where we had like projects and, and tasks that we had to do. And so one of them was pick your most limiting belief that you have and decide it's just a belief, not a fact. Right. And I picked, um, I don't have enough time because everything in my life was like, okay, I can't enjoy the quality of my relationships as much as I could because I always have to rush to the next thing or, you know, I wouldn't be able to finish something because, you know, well, I get distracted and I have to do this thing too. And it was really interfering with my life. Mm -hmm. And I'm a little bitter about it. I still struggle with it, but I had to, um, again, something I learned in a support group, fake it till you make it. Well, just pretend like you have enough time. And how would you act? I'm like, okay, I could probably do that. You know, pretend like I'm not in a rush, like stop and listen to people, stop rushing. Mm -hmm. and, and it took me years. I mean, gratitude. 
nearly 35 years out, right? I've had a lot of time to practice some of this stuff. But I'm, um, when I made that change, when I finally was able to believe, I, I still don't even know if I believe it any 100%, but you know, I've gotten much better at faking it till you make it. And, and now I don't rush anymore. I can actually sit down and have quality conversations and yeah. not think about the next thing. Yeah. So, those are some personal changes. That's great. That's wonderful. Yeah, I know. I'm sure a lot of people can relate uh, to what you're saying. Like you have to pack so much in because you don't know how much longer you have, but you're saying it's almost like you can just live your life more fully when you just, you know, live for the day as though you had all the time in the world. Yeah. Yeah. It's a mindset rather than, yeah. I don't think I've changed the amount that I do, but my mindset has changed. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. Well, I know we are at the 645 mark. Um, and so for, for all of you that need to leave us, I wanna thank um, you all for joining us. I really wanna thank uh, Dr. Chang and Sherry Sobrato for that amazing conversation. Like I said, I'm, I'm humbled and, and so honored to be part of what you both created together. And uh, so thank you. I wanted to also just sh share that um, we do have our next webinar, which will be happening. Um, it's going to be on getting a better night's sleep. Um, so that's gonna be on April 21st at 5.30 with Dr. Niha Goyal, who is a psychologist. And for all of you who are able to stay after the show, we're gonna invite you to turn your video on. We're gonna promote you to panelists and we're gonna stop the recording. So uh, we can do that right now. Thank you again so much.